We are full force into the NFL offseason now, as we've hit cap casualty season. The Ringer's Danny Kelly joins us fresh from the Combine to talk Seahawks releases, what direction they'll take with their newfound cap space, and how it affects free agency in the draft. Let's light them up. I'm Jackson Bevins, and this is Cigar Thoughts. Welcome back to the Cigar Lounge. I am Jackson Bevins, and along with my chivalrous producer, Mike Barwin, this is the Cigar Thoughts Podcast. Mike, how are we doing today? Doing great, Jackson. You know anything for you, buddy. Anything for you. (laughs) How how are you, man? I'm good. I don't know how you've stuck with me through three seasons of this show, but... (laughs) Man, you're here and I'm happy about it. And like, we knew that the Seahawks had big decisions ahead of them going into this offseason. And with a new coaching staff and whatever their influence is, they made four cuts in the last few days as the NFL transitions into the new league calendar. They cut Quandre Diggs, they cut Jamal Adams, they cut Will Disley. They cut Brian Monet. They restructured Geno Smith. And in doing so, they freed up about $40 million in cap space, which is not nothing. They went from being 26th in available cap space to 12th, just like that. What stood out to you about that? Yeah, I mean, we've had a lot of conversation about Jamal Adams mainly, but at large, just the large piece of the pie that the Seahawks are allocating towards the safety position, which goes against the grain uh, for most of the NFL. So in one fell swoop, they ousted both of their starters. So Crazy, Julian man. Love stands alone after they brought him in last off season. And like but, maybe Kobe Bryant too, who yeah. they transitioned to safety, but then like he was yeah. hurt and didn't really play. He was kind of the odd man out with, you know, the corner rotation and Devin uh, Witherspoon taking over the nickel. But uh, the, the thing that stands out to me most about this is in conjunction with the fact that Bobby Wagner probably isn't back. Who is going to fill that leadership presence on defense? Because in the year that Bobby was in Los Angeles, Quandre was the defensive team captain. That's an excellent point. I mean, you know, it's it's not something that shows up on the spreadsheet, but like the players in the locker room, they don't give a fuck what the spreadsheet says. They are responding to the alpha personality in the locker room, and maybe the top two guys outside of Geno Smith are gone now. Sure, sure. Will Disley, the tight end situation is an interesting one for the Seahawks just because now that he's out, both of their other tight ends, uh, our guy Colby Parkinson and Noah Fant, are free agents. So what does the future of that position look like for the Seahawks? Are they going to pay you know, uh, a commensurate contract for a guy who was like a borderline lottery talent in Noah Fant? You're going to bring back Colby Parkinson, who has continued to come on stronger and stronger throughout his career with the Seahawks and had that game winning touchdown catch in Tennessee towards yep. the end of the year. I mean, it's they've got a lot of uh, a lot of decisions to make and we're just on the cusp of free agency. So we're going to find out soon, my man. No, it's it's super interesting because like in a sense, it's like, oh, the Seahawks, they got all this money to spend now, but like. They just created some holes. I mean, I think I think Will Disley and Brian Monet, you can kind of I think you can find guys who do what they do. And maybe it's those two guys who are back on a cheaper contract. But at safety, the way the NFL is trending, the safety position has become more important and and the Seahawks have spent more on that position, both from a draft capital and a salary cap standpoint than any other team in the NFL over the last honestly decade. Now there's a big gap there, right? Like you do have Julian Love and 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 Kobe Bryant potentially, but like there's no way they roll into next season with just those two guys at safety. You know, maybe Jarek Reed comes along and and there's something there, but like that's day three draft pick. So in a sense, great to have the money, but like now you also have some holes that you got to spend that money on with big decisions with Leonard Williams, and Jordan Brooks, and what do they do with Tyler Lockett and, and all of that. And like, look, we couldn't ask for a better guest to help us dive into all of this than the one we have today. But first, if you're listening or watching the show, it's hopefully because you like it. And if you like the show, there are a few ways you can support it. 
If you're on Apple Podcasts or Spotify, take a couple of seconds to leave us a five-star rating. And if you're feeling super supportive, a quick review as well. You can do that right now. You can also subscribe to our YouTube channel where you'll find full video episodes, entertaining clips, and the audio reads of every Cigar Thoughts article. This is probably the best way to help the show grow, and growth is going to enable us to bring more of our football discourse your way. So we're grateful for the few seconds it takes to like and subscribe. And, as always, you can get your official Cigar Thoughts cigars at CigarThoughtsNFL.com, sponsored by Seattle Cigar Concierge. Listen, man, this is where the offseason gets interesting. The Seahawks finally find themselves with north of $40 million in effective cap space entering free agency, albeit, like I said, with a few more holes to fill. Sitting down to talk about all of it with us is one of the brightest stars in the NFL media constellation. He is the co-host of the Ringer NFL Draft Show, the Ringer Fantasy Football Show, and the creator of the number one draft guide on the internet. I'm also honored to call him a close friend of mine. He is Danny Kelly. Danny, thanks for making the time. Of course. I'm happy to do it. How are you doing? I'm doing great, man. It's a little, a little chilly up here in the Northwest right now. I've got my coat on inside while the yeah. studio heats up. But uh, yeah, man, spring's around the corner. It's the most interesting time of the NFL season, honestly, I think. And yeah. and I know that it is for you as well. But like, look, you, you obviously do a ton of work year-round covering a league that never sleeps. But I feel like this time of year is especially concentrated for you. You just got back from the combine. I know you're neck deep in draft prep. First of all, how are you holding up? And secondly, <laughs> what stood out to you about the combine experience this year? Uh, first of all, I'm hold up okay. A little tired. Um, this is a true story. Last night, I wanted. I was like, I'm not going to do any work tonight. I'm just going to go to bed. I got in bed at 9:30 and I fell asleep at 1:30. I like couldn't fall asleep. It was like the most brutal situation. Uh, but anyways, uh, other than that, I'm doing great. What is it that's keeping you up? What, what, what? Cause I, I, I have the same thing with work, right? Like yeah. my, my mind will get spinning about the things that I got going on mm-hmm. in, in my job, in my life. Is it kind of the same thing? Or are you like rolling over pronunciations of like the Samoan <laughs> offensive linemen that are coming right. up in the draft? <laughs> uh, it's a combination of all, everything. It's literally anything that wants every, anything that gives you stress in life. You'll just like, think about it. like 10 years ago, this like awkward thing you did with a girl or something. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> That, oh, right. let's, start, let's start thinking about that right now. You know? yeah. Um, yeah, totally. So no, it's just uh, it's honestly just mainly. I think my circadian rhythm right now is I don't usually sure. go to sleep until like at least midnight, and so my attempts to get caught up on some rest yesterday was just it, uh, horrifically failed. Uh, but that's okay. Um, the combine was super fun. It was, uh, you know. Th- Half of it is like going to the actual event and and seeing the podiums. And I like to size people up as I say it, like just kind of get a, get a a overall vibe of what these people are like and how big they are physically and, and, you know, kind of all that stuff together, how they, well, cause there's, there's on paper measurements and then there's like presence, right? Right. Right. I mean, like for instance, last year, Anthony Richardson, like seeing Anthony Richardson in person, it's like, okay. Yeah. (laughs) This guy's an NFL player. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, kind of like on the other hand, like everyone remembers this and it's it's kind of just a parody at this point. But like seeing Hunter Renfro at the Combine a couple of years ago, I was like, is this guy coming on our podcast later? Like, wh- who is this guy? How is this man in the NFL? You know, um, just a Benjamin Solak lookalike. <laughs> yeah. He's about to get drafted. He's like approximately the same size. Um, How was Brock Bowers? Does he look like he's going to go on the Ringer NFL show anytime soon? Bowers is freaking built. I mean, he's just like hard as a co- uh, as a coffin nail type of foot like guy. Like just you could just tell he's just like <clears throat> like, you know, just built tough, built diff. Um, and so, yeah, I love I love Brock Bowers. Uh, I will say it doesn't always work. Because I remember distinctly seeing Chris McCaffrey at the combine a couple of years ago, like a long time ago. Yeah, and and I'm like, God, he's small. It's just like <laughs> weird. it's like that is a, he's not very big. Running well, backs, running backs in general, when you see running backs, you're like, that is an extremely short man. That guy is short, and obviously they're like built like really muscular, but. It's it is still sort of stark to see like the how short these people are in real life. No no shade. It's just like you don't right. expect it. You know what I mean? Because well, they're, they're larger. They're than life. so larger than life to us yeah. on on TV, right? But it's also like this kid's twenty one, and I feel like a huge part of that is how do you dress for the combine? Like 
Bauer still hasn't recovered from that picture next to Gronk where, you know, he, like, he looks like an AV tech. That. Yeah. And it's like, well, you know what? If you if you were wearing like an Under Armour shirt, <laughs> you'd probably, you know, come off a little bit different. So, yeah, it is yep. it is kind of funny to me the the sort of meat market sense because if yeah. you're there and you're sizing them up as someone who's covering the league, you know the GMs whose reputations are staked on picking the right football guy are yeah. sizing that up as well. Yeah, I mean, it, and I remember uh, Jim Nagy, who was a longtime scout with the Seahawks, now he runs the Senior Bowl. He tweets it about it pretty commonly that like they believe pretty strongly in like going and being on the sideline for like warmups and taking videos of the warmups and seeing just like how these players are built like physically, you know, where they're, where they hold their weight, you know, where, how they move, how quickly they're coming out of their stance, all that stuff. It's like obviously a very inexact science and probably, um, you know, not super accurate if you, if you're being honest, but like the, it, there is just inherent, like this is the, but the biases that human beings hold. Like you want guys that are going to look like they're going to like kick someone's ass essentially. And are you talking about the Seahawks specifically or just like general managers no, and general, scouts in like, general? I think just evaluator, like evaluators, people in the NFL. Um, and you know, obviously the things are changing a little bit as the NFL kind of continues to evolve, you know, that's getting uh, a little smaller. Oh, at some lot, of the positions it's getting like a lot smaller, like <laughs> yeah, very quickly. Man. I mean, you got 165 pound receivers, you got 165 or 70 pound uh, cornerbacks. I mean, um, Nate Wiggins, who the corner out of Clemson is like six foot one, 173 pounds. Like he is insanely skinny and he's probably going to be a first round pick, like even still. And so, you know, you, you have what used to be outliers and maybe they still are going to be outliers at the end of the day, but you have, guys that used to be outliers 160 pounds 170 pounds like even lighter sometimes i think tank dell was like in the 150s two two outwells in the 150s these guys are really really skinny and they're going out there and still producing and and you know tank dell obviously looks like a superstar I, two two outwell is probably just a role player in the nfl but like you know he had some big games this last season or or the season before i can't remember the timeline was he doing it in the same puka year i'm totally blanking now but anyways he had a couple of big games um and you know so yeah he had he had big plays against the seahawks this past year yeah maybe this was yeah tutu was just going off before cup came back i think i'm remembering like the timeline now um but anyways you know it's it's a different nfl now so guys can be a lot skinnier because there's much more protections for defenseless players and and things of that nature and the game is spreading out players are getting smaller i saw that like linebackers and edge players this is the smallest combine for those two positions ever and so that tells you a lot i feel like um Every, like players are just getting smaller and more athletic and faster. Well, it feels like the game is evolving towards speed and angles yep. more so than just like mass. Right. And, and so, and, and obviously like offenses have evolved so much from a schematic standpoint, we're seeing college influence in the NFL a lot more than we used to. And in, in college, the highest flying offenses are generally the ones that create the most space. And, and we're starting to see that bleed into the NFL a little bit. Mm-hmm. But, you know, speaking about the Seahawks specifically, we obviously have a big vibes shift going from Pete Carroll. I mean, it's going to be a big vibes shift going from Pete Carroll to anybody. But it feels like they took a, a really big swing in some ways in a very opposite direction by bringing in Mike McDonald. Yep. What, what sort of vibes are you picking up on while you were on the combine? Hearing people talking about McDonald, hearing people talk about the next chapter of the Seahawks. Uh. It's got to the point where it's starting to make me nervous that it's almost universal praise <laughs> at this point. Yeah. Like I haven't talked to anybody like either in the league or a Seahawks fan or whoever um, that doesn't love the hire, you know, and that obviously could be a good thing. It could be a great thing, but it also it's is probably a, little... a good thing, <laughs> but it's also like my spidey senses are like, ah, like maybe we all <laughs> like when was the last time everybody agreed on something in the NFL? It's like it almost all, like universally is it goes the opposite way kind of deal. Um, like my Tony, Tony Pollard love from last year. Um, right. right. But no, I think yeah, you're right. Like, obviously this is a huge shift from the age of the entire coaching staff. I would say, you know, especially with going from the oldest head coach in Pete Carroll to, I believe he's now the youngest head coach in the NFL, Mike McDonald. Um, it feels like a lot of the coaching hires that he made are kind of like younger or newer to the league guys that are coming up and still trying to be making their name in the NFL, like hungrier players or hungrier coaches, I should say. Um, you know, I think I just generally, this is maybe just me thinking, overthinking it too much, but I'm like, 
guys that are sort of on the cutting edge in a lot of different areas, like like the OC pick, Brian Grubb, to me, it's like this could be like a guy who comes in and is doing things that nobody else is doing, which is like wild and, and awesome to think about for, for the CX. Again, that could go wrong, but I'm very excited to see how it all goes. And then, of course, you know, obviously Pete Carroll's defense has evolved over the years, but like my impression and overall impression of the the total corpus of Pete Carroll's uh, you know, defense in Seattle was that it was like, Hey, we're going to line up and be better than you. Um, and our scheme is not going to be real complicated. We're just going to be really, we're just going to execute it perfectly. We're going to have good players that are are willing to like rally and tackle. And we're going to keep everything in front and all these like really sort of basic, um, uh, like philosophies, I guess, for how you play defense. I know that over the years it changed and they did different things and, 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 you know, it wasn't always the same thing, but, um, that's just sort of my general like feel what Pete Carroll was. And then on the opposite end of the spectrum, you have Mike McDonald, who is, you know, uh, what was the expression he uses is like complexity. Uh, what the illusion of complexity, I think is what he says. And I, I really like that because Love it's that. like, Love that. you know, you don't know where pressure is coming from. Like it's very, you make things more difficult on the, on the opposing quarterback. He's thinking he's there. Therefore slower. You get that with every player on the, the offense. Like, they don't exactly not, know what not something Pete Carroll from. defenses have really been doing. I think like very generally, like that's not that was not like Pete Carroll's sort of like tack is to like confuse the hell out of the offense. You know, it was always just like we're going to be really, really um, you're just going to out execute you out hit you and, and things like that. So um, I think there's just general differences in, in philosophy and, and style. I think they're obviously, you know there's still going to be like a heavy focus on like being tough and running the ball and things like that that are, that are not changing and probably for the best. Um, but again, on both sides of the ball, I'm like th- for the first time in forever, it's like, Ooh, I cannot wait to study what we're going to be doing here. This is going to be right. super fun. Like I can't wait to watch uh, Grubb's screen game because the Seahawks famously have been terrible at screens for almost my entire lifetime. Um, and so, yeah, there's a lot of exciting things happening. And again, I can't, I can't wait to study kind of like what they put on, in the first couple of weeks. Cause I think it's going to be pretty different than what we're used to. Yeah. Hey Mike, make sure I circle back on, on Ryan Grubb with Danny at some point in the show. Cause I, I do want to dig into that <clears throat> a little bit, but uh, Danny is it safe, safe to say that you, you left the combine and, and granted you're, I mean, you write about the NFL, you're a Seahawks fan. You cut your teeth covering this team, but what you do is, is cover the league as a whole. So the Seahawks are 3% of the NFL, but is it safe to say that the vibes surrounding them league wide are positive at this point? Yeah, for sure. I I think like in the NFC West, obviously you're dealing with the 49ers and and the Rams being, you know, pretty well established and pretty feared, uh, you know, for, for different reasons. Obviously the 49ers are the most feared, but like, I think the Rams, everyone acknowledges like the Rams just are really good at, at scouting for their own team and putting in and building winners out of team or, or rosters that maybe don't look like all that great. So the coaching is obviously very good. The evaluation is like really strong. So I think there's a ton of respect for McVay and what his staff does. And obviously Stafford is one of, regarded as one of the best quarterbacks in the NFL. So I would say they're still lagging behind in the NFC West in terms of like the, the national perception. Um, but again, like I said, everybody that I've talked to is like, Oh yeah, McDonald is good. Like he's really smart. He's a really good leader. That's the other thing I heard a lot was mm. like leadership and teaching. Like the way that he teaches is really unique, or not, maybe not new, unique, but like really, really effective. I like the fact that he's a little bit younger. Not that not that Pete Carroll couldn't um, connect with young players, but like just honestly, the the generational divide is like cut in half now. <laughs> like you got guys that are around totally. his age. Well, and, so, and that was even even with Pete being a little bit older when he became the head coach of the Seahawks, that was kind of like a feather in his cap is that he was super dialed in to college and yeah. to these players that were coming in and, and what they want out of their NFL experience. And Mike McDonald was coaching a college defense two years ago. I mean, not only age wise is the gap not that small, but experience wise, he he was right there in the college trenches. Yep. You know, 24 months ago. <laughs> I know. And that's, and that's, um, you know, we, we saw early in Pete Carroll era, like they, I think they caught, caught some edges based on sort of like their knowledge of these guys in recruiting. And like, obviously some of the USC players, they found some really important role players from USC. It's not necessarily gonna be like, oh, they're going to take this guy in the first round because he went to Michigan or whatever. But 
you know, they could find guys in the middle to late rounds that they know their personalities. They know their work ethics. They're, they're familiar with these guys pretty intimately. I think Ryan Grubb, same deal with like the Washington players. So there's a little bit of an edge there, or there could be. Um, right. And on the other side of the spectrum or on the other side of the coin, it's like these players come in and kind of know what they're doing and they know the yeah. program and they, they can hit the ground running a little bit better. So I think that's super fun to think about and, and how they could get an edge there. Um, but yeah, it does. It, it reminds me pretty much about the first couple of years of the Pete Carroll era where it was like, you know, they're coming from the college game. They have a pretty strong knowledge of that. I'm hoping that like the grub thing will end up being, you know, like a, a uh, like a trend in the NFL, kind of like his stuff, like kind of spreads too. obviously, I still need to like figure out exactly what his thing is. But, um, you know, watching Washington, watching Washington last year. I think it's pretty clear this is a super fun offense. <laughs> like just well, yeah. I mean, way. they were the number one offense in in college football, and you know, we had Corbin Smith on uh, last week, and he, you know, he is super knowledgeable about all these coaches, and and really spends a lot of time watching college football. And I think one of the exciting things about Ryan Grubb to me is yes, bringing in sort of a cutting edge. This clearly work at the highest level of college football offense to the NFL is an exciting prospect. We'll see if it transfers, but I think that one of the things that compounds my excitement with that is there's a lot of skill overlap with the Washington offense and the Seahawks offense. And and I remember, you know, you and I were texting about potential comps for Penix, Michael Penix. And, and I said, Geno Smith, you know, I, I, I think there's a lot of similarities there. Obviously you've got a a pretty natural overlap with the receivers. I think Roma Dunze and DK Metcalf have a lot of similarities, both in build and skill set. You've got, you know, McMillan and Polk. There's a lot of overlap with Tyler Lockett and, and JSN there, you know, the, the different he's never had a running back like Ken Walker. Like I think Charbonnet is is much more in the Dylan Johnson role yeah, or, or yeah. vice versa. But uh vice versa. Jeez, Heifetz moment. Vice versa. <laughs> uh <laughs> but like, you know what I mean? He's he hasn't had a home run hitter like Ken Walker. I mean, there's maybe five, six of them on the planet. But also he doesn't have the offensive line. And and when we start talking about the draft, I'm I'm curious to get your thoughts on that. But just to put a bow on your combine experience, obviously, you know, there's different people weight what they learn at the combine differently, right? Some people put a lot of stock into it, some people put almost no stock into it. But you just just from your perspective, I'm not asking you to universalize this at all. You can answer this either specific to the Seahawks or league wide. What expectations did you have about certain teams or players of the process going in that changed over your week in Indianapolis? Oh, that's a good question. Um, I think so. The one of the big benefits of the combine, just uh, as from a big picture point of view, is first of all, the teams are run by human beings, and these human beings are infallible not infallible they're fallible and some of these guys like to talk and some of them like to go drink and like that naturally <laughs> produces like it, uh, it's like the the rumor mill like if it's just like a like a, a graph it's like like it goes up like yeah the combine well, is it's, amazing it's the only that. time you have all 32 front offices yeah. in the same city all year right exactly so like guys love bullshit and guys love talking some of it is smoke screens of course you go out there and you like talk about guys that you want to fall you talk about them negatively or whatever um, things like that. But, you know, at the end of the day, you have agents talking to media, you have agents talking to GMs, you have GMs talking to media, you have GMs talking to coaches, you have coaches talking. It's like the the rumor mill is just like on steroids after the combine. Oh, and God, I, I, I bet. I think it's like you start to get a better idea of where teams are leaning. I think like one of the, <clears throat> excuse me, one of the like big, I think, plots that we kind of saw develop is like, there's less certainty that the the Patriots are going to stick at number three and pick. Um, it sounds like, you know, there's there was rumors flying around that they would be looking to move back. There was rumors that they were into uh, Baker Mayfield. We'll see if that pans out now that Mike Evans signed back in Tampa Bay. It feels like that's a package deal, but we'll see how that yeah. goes. Um, and yeah, so like things like that where, you know, you start to get an idea. Like the other thing is like, Patriots scouting staff and coaching staff and all that was like apparently much more just open and willing to talk to reporters than they had in past years. Obviously like 
the yoke of of Bill Belichick is like lifted, and now we we sure. can be like human beings and like talk to people and not get in, <laughs> in trouble for that and stuff. Like obviously, you're not going out there spilling secrets, but at the very least, it's like the you know the iron curtain has come down, and and like there's people that you can still actually talk to now, kind of deal. Well, with and and deals get done over shots of whiskey, right? Yeah, a hundred percent. Like uh, this is like when you know, obviously when free agency like when the clock strikes free agency or whatever there's like 30 deals that are like immediately reported it's like oh yeah so i guess they'd work quickly on this no it's like deals are being made in indianapolis and they're just like okay as soon as we're legally allowed to talk about this we'll just announce it Um, bar top tampering yeah so it's kind of just like accepted and that's the culture of the nfl essentially if you get caught it's not good but that happens all the time and again it's just because literally human beings are human beings they're physically in each other's presence and they start talking and it's just like this is how commerce has gotten done for millennia. It's it's so funny that it's like actually what happens. You think for these multi billion dollar corporations and, and companies that you know it'd be a little more like high tech or something, but it's it's really just like hey, let's talk this out. <laughs> you know, yeah. let's let's have a beer and talk this out. Um, so I I don't know. I'm kind of rambling, but I, I I do like just the idea of the combine is so old school i love it It, it's just like literally getting people in the same room pressing the flesh baby yeah (laughs) that's kind of like the that's like the biggest vibe i got is just i was just kind of like man this is it's because you see so many coaches and gms like in the bars and stuff it's like they're really just out here just having a good time um you know it's just kind of funny how that all works well, in Indianapolis feels like just an every man city too, right? <laughs> like totally. this isn't like, like some like, highfalutin Los Angeles bar that like most people can't get into. It's just like this yeah, is just like Midwest, these are the restaurants yeah, that are here. Steakhouses, like you're getting these big old steaks. It, literally, the hotel that I stay at every year, the Holiday Inn, it's like right next to a big giant factory with like big like smokestacks. It's a steam factory, <laughs> so it's just like you know super loud. It's just like man, this is. I feel like I'm in like the 1980s. Like, what's the what, all the the right stuff? You know that? Yeah, movie? all the right moves. <laughs> oh, that's right, all the right moves. Um, or fucking like Deer Hunter or something. It's just like this like industrial city. It's not it's not really that, but that's how it feels relative to like my experience. Um, right. So it, it's pretty funny. There's like a train trellis that runs right along the convention center, it's like perfect. those elevated train perfect. trellises. It's just like yeah, it, it just feels. It's not an ivory tower city, right? <laughs> just feels midwestern. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I love that. Well, look, we're going to lean into your draft expertise momentarily, but the seven weeks leading up to it really set the stage. And the Seahawks were pressed face first against the cap ceiling a week or so ago, Mm. but they've since cleared about $40 million by restructuring Geno Smith, cutting a handful of players, including Quandre Diggs, Jamal Adams, Will Disley, Brian Monet. Did any of those moves surprise you? And which ones were you happiest or saddest to see? (laughs) Um, I think so. The the one that maybe was like a little bit surprising was Quandre Diggs. Um, but the other several, you know, Jamal Adams, that does not come as a surprise. That one, I would say like happy is not the right word, but I'm like, yeah, that needed to happen kind of deal. Sure. Like it's, that was not ever going to work out for the Seahawks. Um, and the, the Will Disley one is just extremely logical, I think. Like, mm-hmm. you know, his role, the amount of snaps he plays, like the, the type of impact he's playing is just not really commensurate with, like, the cap hit that he was going to have. Maybe he comes back. We'll see. Like, you know, maybe they re-sign him for uh, a lower number or whatever it is, like sign him for longer and, like, push the cap hits out kind of deal. Um, but th- that one was just, like, logical. You, 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 like, the, the tight end market has not risen in, like, years. And so it's kind of crazy. Yeah, it, it's it's kind of bizarre, but like at the same time, you can find role playing tight ends for very cheap. And yeah. you know, you know, nothing against Disley, but he's not like a superstar tight end. He's playing his role. He's rotating with three guys, and yeah. so it just made sense to do that. Um, but now, obviously, well, there's a huge question of like what we're going to do at safety. Well, this feels like the right year to be clearing the books on the back half of your secondary because. <laughs> good safeties are getting cut everywhere (laughs) right now i mean like and it'll be interesting because i feel like a lot of times you know let's say there's 15 really good safeties in the nfl and maybe in a given year two or three of them get cut because of cap reasons or or whatever right this year there are so many to choose from it'll be interesting to see because pete carroll had you know during his tenure in seattle was revolutionary in how he invested draft capital 
and how he and John Schneider invested cap, you know, like real cap hits on safeties, which is not considered a premium position league wide. And of course, last year they had the highest paid safety group in the NFL. There might be because there's such a glut of available talent all of a sudden. I'd be curious to see how much money they end up spending to replace Quandre Diggs, who I think is still a very good player, and Jamal Adams, who certainly could be a very good player still, uh, or if they just go with like a full reset in the draft. Yeah, it's, I mean, obviously we don't know enough about, you know, McDonald in terms of his personnel moves or how much he's even going to be involved in personnel, you know, because maybe this is like, John's finally like, this is my show. I'm right. not going to let the coach tell me who to draft or who to who to pick or whatever. I doubt that's going to be like quite that black and white. Like they'll probably work together. But um, when you look at the Ravens roster for last year, it's like Kyle Hamilton was one of their best players. He was a highly drafted blue chip prospect. And so if you look at that, you're like, I could see them really making it a heavy focus and a, and a, and a priority to get like a big time playmaker a guy who can like move around the defense you know, Hamilton was kind of all over the place. He would come up, play over a slot. He would play back. You know, he's kind of, he was used as a blitzer, which again is indicative of the type of defense they were playing. I love that. Um, so to get a guy like that would be obviously pretty important if if McDonald is going to run the same type of thing that he did in, in Baltimore. Obviously the personnel is like totally different, but that makes me think they would spend a lot or go spend high in the draft if they find a guy that they really like. Um, but yeah, I mean, at the same time, you know, you're cutting a couple guys, you're cutting a couple starters. Maybe they don't see that as a super big priority this year. And they, they think they can just go out and kind of like get it done with jo- uh, Julian love and whoever else they end up putting back there. So, um, I think I would say lean that it'd be a big priority, but it's tough to know. Like the fact that Justin Simmons got released like today, it's crazy. Um, you know, there, there's quite a few like really big names out there on, on the free agent market and, so, yeah, I think this is going to be probably something the Seahawks end up doing in free agency is getting a, a guy that they think will fit that Hamilton role. Well, yeah. So, I mean, obviously there's a lot of talent out there on the free agency market, but when you're signing free agency, you're spending for that. Compare the free agent class of safety to the draft class of safety. Like knowing that Seattle has, as it stands, a pick in the middle of the first round, then they don't pick again until a couple of shots in the third round. And then it's day three after that. Are there guys in this class that you feel like, okay, you know what? Maybe they take a pass on free agency with safety because there's some guys they can target that I think are going to be good versus like, you know what? You should probably just go spend on those guys right now. I I would lean spending. Mm -hmm. Um, I think, you know, there's a couple of guys I would say that are in like that day two range that I, I find very intriguing. Tyler Newbin from Minnesota. Um, is really long and versatile and athletic and kind of can do a lot of things. So like he'd probably be the guy I circle, but you know, I would, I probably would not be super excited about depending on this rookie class uh, for, you know, being a, a early starter in the scheme, if that makes sense. I, I'd rather go with some of these more experienced guys. Um, and ideally someone who kind of knows the system and knows like what he's asking for, what McDonald will be asking for. So I, I would probably lean, you're, you're getting better value and, and quicker adjustment in free agency than going out and doing in the draft. I just think that this isn't like necessarily the year to like depend on a safety. Sure. Sure. Well, let's, let's transition into the draft because I feel like the only thing that touches the Super Bowl is the NFL draft in, in terms of anticipation and excitement and all of that. I mean, and like, I get it. It's, it's Christmas for all 32 teams and their fan bases represents a peek into a potentially glorious new era for everybody. I I know that you're still in your process of really diving into the incoming class of rookies, but you know, I'm, I'm curious as you look at Seattle's roster, put yourself in John Schneider's shoes with all the moves that are being made. What, how would you prioritize the positional needs for this roster? Good question. Uh, Offensive line. Interior offensive line, I guess I'm just like looking at their R Lads page and it's like, ooh, a lot of free agents right in the middle there. Um, obviously, you know, they might have the younger guys that they think are coming up and they can rely on. But is this a good draft for that? Yeah, for sure. I, I well, particularly tackle, but I think there's a lot of guys that can kind of play the swing position, either tackle or guard. There's a couple of guys that can play either center or guard. 
Um, you know, the the in if if we're talking about first round players, uh, they've been connected a lot to uh, Troy Fautanu from Washington, who is and he awesome. crushed the combine. I mean, he looks like he could play any of the five positions. Like he has the length and movement skills to play tackle if that's what they think he's going to be. But I I could see him absolutely playing guard. And I mean, I I've never seen him play center. I don't think, but. He could probably play center, just like his movement skills, his his athleticism, his toughness, uh, his length. He just to me would be if we took him in the first round, I'd be like, hell yeah, like that's like just a really solid, you know, right down the fairway pick. He's going to be a good contributor for you. He's going to solidify the offensive line. He knows, you know, the offense that he's going to be running. So I think there's just a lot of value to to doing that, and and that's like right where I see him going, that right in that range. Um, but there's a ton of tackles. You got guys like Jackson Powers Johnson, the center from Oregon, who I think is SpongeBob. Like, yeah, he's built like a square. He's literally built like SpongeBob SquarePants. Like it's kind of wild. He has a square body. Um, and he's, I think he could play center or guard. Um, Graham Barton, he's a tackle from Duke, who I think most people think will be an interior lineman. But again, he's kind of got like that five position capability that I've heard his name a lot over the last couple of weeks. It, and he's just the technician. He's just one of those guys that, you know, he's always in fundamental stance. He's always like aware of where the pressure's coming from. He's just kind of like, he's not like physically overpowering or super impressive looking like, you know what I mean? Like he's not like uh, a Marius Mims. He's like six, eight to uh, 340 pounds. <laughs> Looks like he's a giant, like, that's not this guy. Mims but, is like a, a mythological creature. Did, did you see the picture of him standing with media? Members? Oh my god! Legitimately it, twice as big as anyone. Like yeah, literally. Um, yeah. So you know, obviously he's not like that, but um, Graham Barton isn't. I mean, but he he's a type of, type of guy I could see them liking. Um, but yeah, there's a lot of tackles, a lot of swing guys, and so if this is the year. The, the Seahawks just go out and like draft for the trenches, whether that's offense or defensive line. I think that's like the smart move. Um, they have a lot of, there's a lot, there's a ton of receivers in this class. Uh, I wouldn't want to spend a, probably a day one pick on a receiver just based on positional needs, but I could see them if they do trade back into the first or trade it, or sorry, if they trade back into the second or trade back into the second, I could see that being a, a position they like again, guy like Jalen Polk I'm familiar with the scheme. I love him. Right. I think he's, He's borderline yeah. first round talent. Um, and he, too many receivers this year. <clears throat> yeah. And so, you know, he's the type of guy who could like long term kind of replace Lockett if Lockett retires after the season or, or whatever. There's actually some indication that he might even be done already. Like we'll see what kind of happens, but you know, he has a lot of interest. Ty Lockett has a lot of interest outside of football. He's got his real estate thing. He does uh, he has like a, he wrote a book, a poetry. He's got all these other interests, and maybe he's just like ready to hang it up. We'll see. But um, regardless, it's probably like only one or two more years in the NFL. So I think receiver is more of a need than people think, probably just because we just spent a first round pick on a receiver. But I, I'm of the opinion you need at least two really high level guys, and having three is like only going to help the quarterback. So keep keep going in that direction too with receiver or tight end. Get a good like a big time tight end. I'm glad you uh, touched on the wide receivers and the offensive linemen because, Danny, I'm sure all of our listeners are well aware of the fact that you are the Mozart of player pro comps. Mm, mm -hmm. So I'm curious. Give yourself It's time to give yourself a little pat on the back here. Which okay. of your, uh, I guess, out, coloring outside of the lines pro comps was your favorite from this year's draft guide? From any player, any player or, or any position? Any, any position. Well, if we're talking player. about, if, if you're calling me Mozart, uh, my Vivaldi comp is probably my favorite one. Um, that was the best. That was for Caleb Williams, right? Yeah, so Caleb Williams, it's like my tagline is essentially like you've heard the song before, but you've never seen it played that way. There's a there's a clip on TikTok or YouTube or all of them um, where this Russian guy is playing an accordion and he plays uh, Winter by Vivaldi, which is a song you I, you will immediately recognize. Absolutely. I guarantee you you've never heard it on a fucking accordion before. And it is the most impressive thing I've ever seen in my life. It is so crazy. He's playing like the entire symphony, like the entire, every, every uh, like instrument he's playing on this accordion it's crazy um anyway so that was like i was drunk one night and, and i saw that i was like this is a good kid like this is like Caleb Williams. like he has like he, he's doing it in a completely different way and it's in cr it's crazy impressive and i and you know he's a savant and you're not 100 percent sure how he's doing it but it's like 
it's just really impressive to watch. I don't know for sure that Caleb Williams is going to end up being a, a great NFL quarterback, but I do feel very confident that he has like insane tools, like really rare, just arm talent, ability to throw off a platform, a really incredible field vision and knowing where guys are at all the time. Uh, he's extremely escapable. People don't really talk about his running that much. Um, it's almost like the pendulum swings back. It's like, oh, this is a black quarterback. I'm not going to talk about him running, but he like can run. I think he's really underrated as a runner and a scrambler. Oh, um, God. Like, he, he makes, you guy, know, he you like know makes he guys is? fall down like in open field. Like he's he's he, he runs kind of like Mahomes, like he's kind of like a waddler. Um, yeah, but, but he like makes people w- miss. You know how you and I listen to podcasts at like extra speed, like 1. <laughs> 1.5 or right. 1.75, right? Like that's what I feel like. In, in terms of running, he does run like Mahomes. Like he's got this kind of weird yeah. cadence to his stride, yeah. but it's faster. Yeah. It's faster. And Caleb Williams reminds me of like when you would have Michael Vick on the old Madden games, where it's just like <laughs> you could have two rushers come free, but it's fucking Caleb Williams, yeah. you know? He he's like the he's like if you saw a D one college basketball player like shows up to the Y and starts like playing against a bunch of like you know YMCA dorks in their 30s he's just like embarrassing them it's not necessarily he's like dunking over them he just like has such good handles he's just making them fall down they're so he's so good at dribbling kind of deal like that's like what it reminds me of it's just like he's running circles around people as a scrambler and and that's how he buys himself a little extra time in the pocket I think you know Steven Ruiz the ringer um quarterback guru who i respect immensely for we just had him on two weeks ago yeah he, like first of all you know i think there is value in someone who's willing to go against the grain and to be like not just admitting like what everyone else thinks and like obviously people were really up in arms about his brock purdy takes for a long time but like i totally respect his process uh steven ruiz's process in, in terms of evaluating quarterbacks and like Same. trying to strip out all the other variables and just say like what is this quarterback doing from a play-to-play basis like he's really good at that um and his track record is is really pretty impe- impeccable so um anyway he, I, I remember S- steven said one time to me that one of the most important thing one of the most important like traits you can have as a quarterback and this is what mahomes does better than anyone else in the on the planet maybe um even more than like lamar jackson is just buy himself an extra beat to get a throw off it's whether that is you know juking a guy or whether that means just literally when they get their hands on you, like just being strong and like shrugging it off enough to get the throw off kind of deal. Like he just buys himself one extra beat more than any other quarterback. It feels like, and that's why he can like extend plays better than pretty much anybody. And I see that a lot with Caleb Williams. Nice. And that's why I understand some people compare him to Mahomes. Obviously that's an extremely lofty comp, but like stylistically, I think there are some similarities sure. in the way that they play, not necessarily the quality of quarterback they are. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, I, I think Caleb Williams, long story short, is a he's a maestro on <laughs> on the uh, <laughs> on the accordion. That's a Heifetz joke, by the way, for, for those who don't know. Yeah, um, I'm going to I'm going to text Danny Heifetz, <laughs> let him know he, he got a couple of shout outs. <laughs> but like, OK, so like keeping with with this theme before we move on, Williams, I just I want to give Danny a quick shout out and say that my personal favorite of your pro comps was saying that yeah. Brian Thomas uh, Jr. was akin to Christian Watson or Kenny Powers on a jet ski. So I just want you know to know that just maj- you can picture them, the majestic yeah. image, the visit him to wear like the Kenny shades powers. Yeah, he's, he's got playing. like the wraparound yeah. shades. He's got like his mullet flowing in the air. He's just on this like glass, calm water lake, just standing up on his jet ski, the big rooster tail behind him. And that was just an image that came to me, a vision, really, listen, when, I, when I watched listen, Thomas run I'm, routes. I'm speaking, I'm speaking to the listeners and the viewers right now. If you haven't checked out Danny <laughs> Kelly's draft guide, it is chock full of the most insane comparables <laughs> that you will ever hear, except that like you read them and you're like, oh my God, that's exactly <laughs> it. <laughs> No that's one like, else would think to put it this way. Literally. But that's exactly it. You know what my favorite one from, from this year so far is? It was Marvin Harrison Jr. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Which you said <laughs> is like if Marvin Harrison had a really tall son. 
Can you imagine <laughs> what that would Could be like? Could you imagine? He moves exactly like Marvin Harrison. So, okay. So, like, when I think of the the greatest receivers of my lifetime, right? And I'm thinking about, like, you know, obviously Jerry Rice, like, early on, right? But right. more more modern, you're talking about Julio Jones and, and you're talking about Larry Fitzgerald and all these guys, these big, tall, fucking athletic like, freaks. Yeah, like X guys. Yeah, Des Bryant, all of this stuff. You know, these guys that, that are just dominating on the outside. I've always felt like this kinship towards, like, the thing. Danny, you and I have been playing fantasy football together in, like, <laughs> half a dozen leagues for 15 years. Yeah, You know I got a type. I want guys who get open early. Right. And the two best I've ever seen of that in my entire life are Marvin Harrison and Antonio Brown. I know you're going to say we, Antonio Brown. That's your guy. And, like, yeah. yeah, shout out to all those championships he won me. But, like... <laughs> To me, the most valuable skill is the ability to get open. And if you're big, that's a bonus. But right. usually there's a trade-off there. Marvin Harrison Sr. got open faster than any player I've ever seen in my entire life. And Marvin Harrison Jr. does that at 6'4". Right. Like, I mean, I it, it's tough. You talked about like how the pendulum swings with pre-draft uh, you know, opinions and all, all this stuff. And you almost get like what do they call it? Prospect fatigue. Oh, for sure. Where you talk, you talk about a player so much that you almost feel like obliged to come with a contrarian take. Martin Harrison Jr. Is that guy, right? Yeah. People are in, in the sense that you mean like people aren't talking about him as much as they probably should be. Um, well, yeah. I'd like, tell me he's not Julio Jones ceiling. <laughs> I, I think he is. I think he's kind of in his own tier. Honestly. Um, I, I toyed around with the idea of, putting Malik neighbors in the same tier, but I think He's I've so kind of backed good, off man. that. Cause I, cause I really like Roma Dunze too. I think Roma Dunze yeah. is going to be an awesome pro, but I think ultimately when you're talking about like total skill set and like you said, size, he's supposedly an athletic freak, um, you know, four, three type speed. He decided he just didn't need to run or weigh in or do anything at the combine. Oh, which... I can't remember the last player who ever flexed on the combine the way Marvin Harrison. Oh yeah. Did. By the way, he's he like, did... you know what? I'm, I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna actually just train to be an NFL football player. It's like, oh yeah. Instead yeah, yeah. Of, of coming and doing your, your little dog and pony show in Indianapolis. <laughs> right. Exactly. He's like, you know, I was gonna do that. And then, uh, I just decided to go on living my life. Um, <laughs> But like, yeah, he's yeah. He's, what's what's his floor? Like the fifth <laughs> overall pick, <laughs> right? One hundred percent. So I mean, honestly, I, it, this is the the era of player empowerment in some ways. Obviously, like you know, we see with with transfer portal and NIL in college football, these guys don't feel so desperate to come out of college football, and you got guys that are going back. They're making a lot of money, so they don't have like this pressure to come out and make money in the NFL. They don't have all this pressure. And, and a lot of the time, too, it's it's like you said, it's they know their value. They know their worth. They're not going to like get in line and automatically do all the stuff that players have always done because they know that they're going to be like a top five pick. So why subject yourself to poking and prodding from 32 teams? You know, this is what Caleb Williams did, which I think is pretty unprecedented. And he was essentially like, look, I'm not lasting past like four, like at the latest probably like two at the latest. Why would I go have 32 teams like do tests on me and stuff? Like that's silly. Um and I kind of it's it. not a pleasant experience for these guys. Like No, and it's at, like at also the base of it, the comp- information. You know what I mean? Yeah. We as fans, we focus on like the 40 and the agility drills and the RAS score and all of this stuff, but like the reason the combine exists is for 32 teams to get their doctor's hands right. on these like fucking pieces of meat in <laughs> like historically in their perspective. And like, that's kind of shitty to stand around for eight hours in your underwear while 30 different doctors, you know, like flex your knee and shit. Yeah. So yeah. if you, <laughs> if you've got the leverage to skip that, just skip it. it. Like God yeah. bless you. Yeah. I, I completely understand it. Um, but yeah, so God, what were we even talking about? Oh, it doesn't Marvin matter. Harrison. Here's here's yeah, here's Harrison. the thing. He's like, really good. <laughs> yeah, yeah, he's he's great. And and like along with that, what's really interesting to me about the this draft, what probably stands out to me thematically more than anything else in this draft, maybe more than any other draft since I really started trying to pay close attention to the NFL and how it works. This is a fantasy friendly oh, yeah. NFL draft. Yeah. 
like of the top 10 picks, we could see eight dudes that are getting drafted in your home league in like the first three or four rounds, right? Yeah, it's wild. There's, um, it's just extremely offense heavy overall. But yeah, you got three, maybe four quarterbacks that could go in, in early in the first round. By the way, I think all of them are quote unquote like dual threat guys that can run. Um, totally. And then four, three to four receivers and Brock Bowers, who I, I, I kind of get the impression Bowers might fall into the middle of the first round a little bit more these days. But, um, but yeah, I mean, it's this is you have three elite receiver prospects. You have three, I would say, elite quarterback prospects plus JJ McCarthy, who some people believe is elite and a, a, like a blue chip tight end. So this is awesome. This is like the top. Eight, what is it? The top seven picks, I would say for sure, in dynasty drafts, like super flex dynasty drafts, are like pretty much set, like in some order. Um, yeah, and then, and I don't know that we, I mean, you and I have been playing dynasty together for, for a long time, and 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 honestly, that's like shaped the way that I view the NFL know, and team same. building yeah. and and all that. And I, I think there's a lot of correlation there. Like this year is super unique in that way, and then like flipping back to looking at the Seahawks, this is not the year where they're going after those positions. I mean, last year they went big splashes, right? Jackson Smith and Jigba first receiver off the board. Devin Witherspoon, not a, not a fantasy guy, but that's a perimeter difference making player. Mm -hmm. Took Zach Charbonnet in the second round. Mm -hmm. Like they really lean have leaned into that over mm -hmm. the last few years. This feels like a trenches year yeah. for Seattle. And it feels like, a good draft to be looking at the trenches, especially if you're in the middle of the first round, because you have all of these, you know, highlight worthy fantasy superstars coming out. Yep. That's going to push offensive and defensive linemen further down. I feel like than they would be in most drafts. Yeah, I think. And so they're at 16, right? Um, That's right. They, the Seahawks are probably going to have like, and then when you're talking about like in the middle of the first round, a lot of times what you're talking about is like, oh, it's the cornerback three. It's the offensive tackle four. It's the edge three or four or five. Like you're talking about like you're getting down the line a little bit in terms of like the best player at their position in a draft or like the consensus best player. And, and that like makes it a little bit shaky. You're not quite sure you want to do that um, in this draft. Like you could get the edge one maybe at 16. You know, like in theory, I, I I don't even know who the edge one's going to be. It might be uh, Dallas Turner. It might be Leatu Latu, who I like a lot, but he, he's got an injury history. So there's like some question marks there if he's going to fall. Jared Verse is probably going to be around that area. Chop Robinson. And, and for those listening board. who who are maybe not as familiar with these names, where where are they coming from? So Leatu Latu, UCLA. Um, Dallas. God, Turner. he's got the best hands in the draft. Yeah, he's incredible. He's he's like. He, he's he, he's a fucking nightmare more than any other player like i can't re i honestly like can't really remember watching an edge player who is better with his hands coming out of college football he's just he never gets stalemated you know because like I, I actually find watching corner or that's watching, the offense's goal the yeah. offense's goal is to stalemate like the rusher there in in the, your spot and he never really gets stalemated it's not to say he wins every rep but he never stops moving you know what i mean He's, he keeps that. He's tenacious. He's ferocious as a rusher. He's really good at getting offensive tackles off balance, getting their hands off of him. He has like an incredible repertoire of of moves he uses with hands, like the cross chop, um, side sc uh, the scissors moves, where you're like essentially like batting down an offensive lineman's hands. He's just really good at like swatting away the offensive lineman's hands and getting them off balance. And he pairs that with like club moves. He pairs that with uh, push pull rip moves. Um, you know, just kind of like keep them off balance. He has a really good plan. He's like a very professional pass rusher from that point of view. He's not like the best athlete, um, but I think he's fast enough. He ran a four six, and he is the big question is of course like whether teams are going to have him off his board because he had an issue with his neck that actually cost him to retire from Washington, and he ended up transferring to UCLA and the doctors there cleared him. And so obviously, I think there's some subjectivity there. And we'll see how it all kind of goes, but. Um, He's awesome. I, like, I would be super stoked to see him come to the team. Of course, it's kind of, you know, a little bit worrisome with the Seahawks history of like career ending neck injuries. 
So, um, but I mean, by the same token, they took a shot on DK Metcalf, who had good point. Uh, a potentially he career threatening mainly because of that. Neck. Yeah. And I mean, like in in hindsight, drafting DK Metcalf sixty fourth overall is fucking insane because he'd be a top ten pick in this draft, right? So like, it's crazy. It, it is right. You 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 have these misses, but one thing about John Schneider is he will swing for the fences and, and he seems to be willing to to eat it when that doesn't work out. So, all right, you just recently did a mock draft mm-hmm. and you know, there's a few, there's a thousand mock drafts that come out this time of year. <laughs> so mine's the best. It, yeah. Yeah. Well, right. So this is my point is <laughs> that like, <laughs> there's a, there's a few that I put a higher stock into than most. And yours is one of those. You're at 16. You see the draft playing out the way that you see it playing out. Who do you have the Seahawks taking at 16? And then is that the same person as who you're really hoping they take at 16? Well, I actually, yeah, I had Leati Latu in this last draft um, at 16. And I, but I, I think there's a number of guys there that I'd be really excited about. I I would, I don't know how. Yeah. You don't think the draft is dried up by 16? No, not at all. I mean, I think. It it starts to it starts to get like much bigger question marks kind of right after that right in that area, but I think there's still going to be really good players I'm excited about all the way through like twenty, you know twenty three twenty four twenty five. I'm just looking at some of the guys that I had in my mock here, um, that came off the board after that. Like I mentioned Troy Fautanu earlier. Like Brock Bowers went off a couple of times later. Like I think he's a blue chip player, even though they. have you know, tight end is not necessarily like a huge need, but he like he's so good. He's just like a blue chip player. Like this is going to be a guy who can come in and contribute immediately. Um, there's a couple defensive tackles I think that are going to come off in that area. Johnny Newton from Illinois is really exciting. Byron talk, Murphy from Texas. Uh, Husky fans will know. Who I was going to say, is. talk to me about Byron Murphy because like he was priority number one for you, Dub, when they played Texas in, I uh, in I, the I heard national some whispers semifinals. that he's going to be a top ten pick. In, when I was, in I could movies. see it. Dude's yeah. a monster. He he's essentially like in the same vein. I'm not saying you know you never want to compare a player to like an Aaron Donald, like a like a Hall of Famer, but like it, he's in the same mold where he's like really explosive, really strong, just wreck shop it, w- with whoever's in front of him. He he can like you know drop his weight and, and play the run just fine. But he's really a, like a penetrating, disruptive defensive tackle who can kind of like line up and, and just cause havoc in the middle. Um, and he's really good. I mean, we saw what he did against Washington. He was just like really disruptive um, and constantly living in the backfield. You know, in that game, Penix did a really good job of kind of avoiding it. Um, but he was like always in the backfield in that game. And I think we saw like kind of the potential that that could bring. Well, you also comped Byron Murphy to Justin Matabike, who was a linchpin of Mike McDonald's oh defense my in Baltimore. God. Oh, go. what a great comp, man. There you go. Um, and so he he's another guy that I just be like that's a great pick I I don't think twice about it like I'm happy with that. Um, there's a couple corners that I think would be really cool. There's uh, Darius Robinson, edge guy out of Missouri, was like literally maybe the best player at the Senior Bowl. He was just dominant. Um, I'm a big fan of Chop Robinson. I think he's kind of a controversial one because you know he doesn't have necessarily like an ideal body type. He's he's a little bit. I think he needs to like fill out a little bit and and get stronger. But he has like truly maybe the most explosive get off I've ever seen from a pass rusher. I, I want to say he set the combine record in his uh, 10 yard split. Um, so he, right. his, his explosiveness and burst off the line, very so explosive rare. draft class this year. Yeah. I mean, the athletes are just getting better and better every year, I feel like. Um, and so, you know, there's a lot of guys in this area. If they don't move back and they take one of these players, I'd be very happy with like probably like 10 of these guys. So, I think they have a lot of good options, and of course, maybe that means they are better off moving back a couple spots and still picking up one of these players. But I do think okay. it kind of there is kind of like a shelf at like twenty three, twenty four that I probably wouldn't want to move back further. Okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna give you a hypothetical here. At sixteen, the following players are on the board. <laughs> you're the you're John Schneider. <clears throat> you're picking for the Seahawks. You can't find a trade back partner. Okay, just not yep. you're not getting a deal that that you're happy with. You got to stick and pick. JJ McCarthy has slipped. Brock Bowers has slipped. Latu has slipped. Byron Murphy has slipped. And Fautanu has slipped. They're all there. Give me your top three. That's so hard. Um, 
I think I, I think I have Leatu my highest rank guy. So I probably would lean. No, actually, it's Brock Bowers. Um, so it would probably come down to those two guys for me. I really like Murphy too. Um, I'm gonna throw uh, Jackson Powers Johnson in there because Team Jackson is oh, on a fucking roll with off. the Seahawks right now. <laughs> we got up. we got Jackson Smith and Jigba. We got Jackson Bobo. Yep, Jake Bobo's full name. His Jackson. name is Jackson. Oh this yes, changes, sir. This changes everything. It does. It uh, does. We got <laughs> we got Mike Jackson, which is kind of bridging the gap between <laughs> Team Jackson and Team Mike. Right, right. And now we got Jackson Powers Johnson. So I'm gonna throw him in the mix too. Okay. Uh I'm gonna stick with either like to me, I, I would go with Brock Bowers, Leatu Latu, personally. Um and then probably Murphy would be the next one. Murphy's the guy that I just list. I, I keep coming back to if yeah. he's there. And I've seen him to Seattle in a couple of mocks. Yeah. Like I don't think it's out of the realm of possibility that he's there. I'm still kind of trying to figure out whether I like uh, JJ McCarthy enough to be excited if the Seahawks took him. I think if he if the Seahawks took him, I would immediately talk myself into it just yeah. because of human nature. But right now, I think I would prefer and, and you know me, like I'm a big Geno guy. I think they can get by with Geno for a few years. Like I, I don't see the the urgency in taking a quarterback right here when we can compete. And I keep saying we, I know that, but like, you know. No, it's Seahawks all it's fun. all good. Uh, Mike, isn't it funny? How Twitter, Seahawks Twitter seems to be like split 50 50 on Gino. <laughs> and then every single person that we have on the show is like, yeah, Gino's good. Like, <laughs> not not high on your priority. And then list. every time we post a clip, there's the most hateful shit you've ever read in the comments about Gino Smith and everything that he's accomplished with uh, the city of Seattle. We've. We've probably lost more followers <laughs> than we've gained being pro Gino on this show. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, you guys should start pandering more and just like hate, hating <laughs> yeah. on Gino. You hate you haters, hating ass haters. Where does Drew Locke fall uh, <laughs> among the quarterbacks that have declared oh, for the twenty twenty four NFL draft? Right. I'm all, Blue all, chip. In, all in on Locke. Blue chip. Yeah. Yeah. Um no, but I, I like personally my thought is I I and Hyph or uh, Hyph, it's almost called you Hyphus. Jackson. We we've argued about this actually on, on text message, like whether taking Bowers makes any sense yeah. at number sixteen. And my my I think my argument, which is I think logical, is I could see <laughs> Do you? Do no, you no, think no, your I, argument is sorry. logical? My my <laughs> argument my argument based on like the logic of what I think John Schneider would do. I think you're being totally irrational and idiotic. No, I'm just kidding. Fair. Um, fair. Evergreen. No, I think, I think like, listeners would agree. If I'm putting my if agree. I'm putting myself in John Schneider's shoes, he's sitting there at sixteen. He's got a I don't know what his grading system that the numbers are. He's got a blue chip grade on Brock Bowers, and then he has, you know, like a solid starter grade on everybody else that's still there. Like, what do you do? Do you just no? You swung me. Here's here's you draft for need, or do you take the guy who's a fucking stud and you know he's gonna like? Obviously, no one knows anything. You can't guarantee. No, no, no. But like, look, you you swung. Here, here's the the burden of being me is is that I'm right all the time. (laughs) And that's like a, that's a heavy mantle to bear, but you actually swung me on this because I was like, ah, God, I mean, Brock Bowers is great, but like needs all this stuff. And you're like, look, just take the best player, man. Like if the best player on your board is there, you figure it out. And, and I came around, you can't go broke, take making a profit, you know, (laughs) and by the way, they have other picks. They have free agency. They have, of course, they have, no, this is like Bowers is there. He's, he's, he's the guy you figure it out. This is always something that I encounter when I do mock drafts. It's like, oh, they have a need elsewhere. I'm like, yeah, there's other avenues to address that need. Like this isn't your only like move that you can make all off season. So, I mean, at the end of the day, if you just took the best player on your board at every single pick for. 10 years you're probably gonna yeah. have a better team than drafting for positional need also, it's like, I, I grant uh, you that you you swung me on this i think number one if if we if we want it so yeah i i think that to me is like the most logical and long-term best process uh i will say if you had argument that you don't think browers is as advertised i think that's a fair argument we could make that we could like have that discussion no um, he's that guy but i i, I like watching him he has rare explosion, rare yards after. Dude, they're ball. running. This is Georgia with the best athletes in college football on their team, winning national championship after national championship. Yeah. And they're running fucking jet sweeps 
to this dude. By the way, he was out producing in, in his three seasons. I think I saw this from Scott Barrett, who pointed this out, and I was like, damn, that's true. Love Scott. He, he outproduced uh, A.D. Mitchell, who is expected to be like a first or second round pick <laughs> right. when they were all both at Georgia. He he outproduced Lad McConkey, who is now like a borderline first or second round pick. Like he, he was their number one receiver, you know, and he's all about ball. Like the things you hear about him from off the field are so like it's like legends in the it, like legend in the making. Like he's he sent there's one anecdote I saw, I think, from The Athletic where he texted a picture, a, a video of him like doing uphill wind sprints to his coach like in the mountains like he's like fucking training like he's like an avenger or something and he apparently doesn't talk he's just all about ball he doesn't say anything he just wants to go out and like run through your face and he's really big and strong and physical extremely you know who he reminds me of explosive you know who he reminds me of who i is just like my dream seahawk like of all the players in the nfl is george kittle yeah 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 he's not as big um, no, but like uh, right. same mentality, same, you know, like tone setting physicality. He's like just as excited to seal off like a, a counter run right. as he is to like catch a pass up the seam for 30 yards. Yeah, 100 percent. And he has the same type of like wonky running gait, like, you know, like Kittle just like every part of his body is moving when he runs. You know what I mean? Like it's like, right. you know, and it's not. How do you square that up? <laughs> Yeah, it's like it's like camouflage. You can't really see where the body is. You know what <laughs> it's I mean? Like, like camouflage. Yeah, totally. All right, listen, listen. We're we're talking about a lot of guys at the top of the draft. The Seahawks are not at the top of the draft. I don't anticipate them trading into the top of the draft. Let's move back a little bit. One, how likely do you think it is that Seattle tries to trade back and recoup the second round pick that yeah. they traded for Leonard Williams? And two, who are some of these day two and even day three guys that you're like, I could see this guy being a Seahawk? Great questions. Um, number one, yes, of course, I think they could trade back. <laughs> like right. this is Schneider's mo. Everyone, here's the thing: everyone wants to trade back. This is. I just. I need to address the discourse here. Everyone's like, "Oh yeah, just trade back." You got to find somebody willing to pay you a premium right. Right. <laughs> to move up into your spot. Somebody essentially has to fall to where they're getting. Or right. you know, I think there are small move back opportunities. I don't think you're going to net a second by doing that, but you might want to have a couple more day, th- uh, day late, late day, two picks, third round or fourth sure. runners. Um, and so, yes, I could absolutely see them moving back if they have like five or six guys that they like on their, on their board still. Um, man, there's so many day two guys that I like. Um, I'm just trying to think just of, riff. Just yeah. Riff. So obviously I mentioned Jalen Polk. I think he's awesome. He's the receiver out of Washington. Uh, Zach Frazier, I don't know for sure if he like he'll be around in the second round. I think probably um, he's a center from West Virginia. He's a four time state champion wrestler, which is like all love I need that. to know. You know, I love that. Um, yeah. But he's also like never gave up a sack, and he's like incredible. So I like him a lot. Um, some of the day two and day three receivers are really good. Like I, I know that that's like a big, not necessarily like a huge need, but like honestly, like. I, I'm a huge believer in like redundancy and just the more guys you can have on your team that can like make something happen with the ball in their hands, like you're going to turn into the 49ers because they just keep getting guys that can get yak, that can make plays in space. Like Juwan Jennings was like. I was just going to say Juwan Jennings. I call, I call he him was the like Robert, their best player in yeah, the postseason. The Robert Ori of the, uh, of the 49ers, just <laughs> exactly. the guy who will come in and yeah, fucking totally. win you the game when you need it. Totally. Um, Mike's just nodding his head. Yeah. <laughs> Like if you need a three, if you need a if if you need someone to come off the bench cold and hit a three to win a championship, like Juwan Jennings is your guy. Um, but I, I think like having more and more guys like that is huge. Um, the other Washington receiver, Jalen McMillan, I think is super fun. Um, there are some linebackers that might be day two guys. I think you know Seattle's going to need a linebacker. Yeah, I mean Junior Colson from Michigan is is a guy that I could not I would not be surprised at all to see them targeting. I don't know if he's going to be a first round. I think he'll probably more likely be a second rounder. Um, so maybe if they trade back, he's a the guy they t- uh, target. Um, he's just rangy. He, he's like cerebral. He knows the defense, obviously, because uh, it was a defense that McDonald installed. He kind of does everything for them. He's like, he's just like a guy that fills up the stat sheet. Um, looking through uh, Roman Wilson, another Michigan guy who they probably could like a lot. He's kind of like a do it all slot receiver. I comped him to Curtis Samuel. Yeah, I this is a guy I I like Curtis Samuel to, for for the record. I think he's like a good player underrated he kind of does totally. everything for them 
uh, I think I saw Roman Wilson, something like, uh, it was like 50 out of 70 of his catches were either first downs or touchdowns last year. It's something like that. Um, so he was just obviously a big time playmaker for them in, in key moments. Um, there's a bunch of guards and tackles on day two. Christian Haynes mm-hmm. from Connecticut was really impressive at the senior bowl. Um, I know, I know that like Cooper BB from Kansas State is getting a lot of hype. There's some defensive tackles that are really interesting. Braden Fisk from Florida State was like a freak show at the combine. The dude, main... he has been moving up. Dude, did you see him run the forty? Oh my god! Speaking of Avengers, he he looked like <laughs> like he was like he looked like <laughs> totally. it was like a movie. They, they you know how like they have like they show you like the um how they how they do the special effects in a movie where they have like the cables attached to him and stuff like he's like just running twice as fast as he should be running um there's yeah there's a bunch of corners on day 2 this is a deep class at some positions that are considered like the premium positions so yeah like whether you're talking corner tackle um and, and linebacker i think is obviously a big need for them so linebacker and then of course receivers there's a ton of receivers so, you know, I think they're they're in good shape. If they want to trade back, they're still going to get some guys that they can tr- contribute early on. Um, and, you know, I'm a fantasy guy, so I could talk about like a million receivers and running backs I love, but um, they don't really need running backs at this point. But still, there's some guys that are really, really Oh, my good. God. Yeah, no, totally. All right, listen, last, last question before we get out of here. They do have a couple of really tough free agent decisions to make this year, and they are Leonard Williams and Jordan Brooks. Mm-hmm. How strongly are you prioritizing those two guys if you're Mike McDonald and John Schneider? <laughs> well, so like the sunk cost fallacy or whatever, like I don't know if that's the exact thing, but like you'd you'd hate to see Leonard Williams leave uh, after they gave up a second rounder. Can I'm I'm just gonna interject here and say, look, you made the decision to trade a second round pick for Leonard Williams in October of last year. That was a different universe. Than right. March of 2024, sunk cost fallacy is called a fallacy for a reason. Like <laughs> fuck that, you you already spent it. That money is gone. Right. Don't throw good money after bad. Whatever your approach to Leonard Williams is should be entirely based on what his value is against right. the open market right now. That right. being said, y- you in on this guy? I mean, I think he makes them better. You know, he, he's like a disruptive very experienced he's gonna be able to come in and like play a lot of like really productive snaps for you so like he's 30 years old he's not gonna be a superstar but i think he's like the type of guy who's gonna make your defense better he can he can do a number of different things for you um what i understand is like he is well very well respected by like his teammates and things like that so there's like some leadership considerations in there so yeah i mean i think i i would probably prioritize him i think the brooks thing is is tough because they like don't seem to have like a backup plan right now, or at least there's not an apparent one. So, you know, obviously it's probably important to get him. I, I know that um, Patrick Queen is going to be probably talked about a ton. Maybe well, and both and and Queen speaks reverentially about Mike McDonald too, because right, Queen was actually trending towards being a bust essentially before. Well, that was a big thing in in Seahawks draft in the little Seahawks draft universe was. Jordan Brooks got taken over Patrick Queen. Oh, yeah, yeah. Patrick Queen like was the kind of consensus best off ball linebacker of that draft. And like year one, it was Brooks over Queen considerably. And then mm-hmm. Mike McDonald showed up, and all of a sudden Patrick Queen is everything that he was drafted to be. Roquan Smith showed up too. <clears throat> yeah. That, and <laughs> that um, takes a lot of pressure off. So I th- I think there's just and this is the problem with like free agents and in free agency in general and why there's so many like whiffs in free agency. I think it's just because, you know, there's so many different variables in football and one guy can be like an awesome fit with the current construction of a defense and the current personnel of defense in the scheme and then come to a new team where like he's not getting help or whatever from whoever and he falls apart or he's just not nearly as good. We see it like every year. Um, but that being said, like it, it's it's fun to ponder the idea of them signing both Brooks and Queen and having like two really fast, rangy linebackers. Mm-hmm. I don't know if that's even possible with the amount of money they have, but um, you know, I'm excited to kind of see how they fill that position in general because um, I think it's well, an it's important super one. interesting. I, think it's an I important mean, one you, in this defense. Yeah. You have yeah, you have Leonard Williams on the interior defensive line, and like 
He's a free agent at the same time that Justin Matabuke, who played a similar role in Baltimore, is a free agent. Well, he and got franchised, got, so I think he's not yeah, going anywhere. Well, well, right. And I'm not talking about Matabuke as like a, a sign, you know, a tag and trade option for Seattle. I'm more speaking within the realm of the defense that Mike McDonald has run. Right. You do have a lot of uh, talent and skill set overlap between Williams and Matabuke and obviously Brooks and Patrick Queen. It'll be curious to see how much McDonald wants to stay in house versus pursuing the guys that he already knows he yep. can win with. Yep. I know. And I think that uh, the other wrinkle in this whole thing is I think, and Schneider's mentioned this a bunch of times that they have a lot of pride in the, in the culture that they've already got established in Seattle and like the roster and the team. And he's talked about that multiple times. Like we think we have a really good culture. And so maybe that means frankly, that just Schneider's just like, look, make it work with my guys. Cause like we, we trust the culture here. We trust the guys. We know the guys and maybe they're less likely to like bring in random outsiders that, maybe aren't the same fit in Seattle as they were in Baltimore. I, this is just me like, you know, theorizing. I have no, like, that's why we've got you inside here. Inside info on that. I just think like, um, I think in free agency, you have to be kind of careful because, and this is again, why we see so many free agents fail or like when they change teams, they just never really pan out. Um, unless you're like a really elite talent is, is a lot of times you go to a new team and it's like a, just a different vibe, a different culture, different fit, a different scheme. You don't fit it that well. Um, and, you know, and it's just never you like these, a lot of these times these players just never look the same. So I, I think you got to be a little bit careful about that and like be really strategic about if you are bringing inside guys or outside guys in, make sure that they're like, you know, guys like Leonard Williams, essentially. I think that's why they were willing to spend a second rounder on him is because like, well, Pete was familiar with him, I believe. And you know, he had a reputation of being like a great, like team guy. So I think there's, those are considerations you got to have. They were also five and two and in first place in the NFC West at the time. Got a little out in front of their skis on that one. Yeah. yeah um, I think so. Over their skis, I should say. Yeah. Um, but yeah, yeah, I think they thought they were going to be like one of the best teams in the NFC. So sometimes, well, sometimes you got to go for it. You know, you only live no, one. Maybe, I don't, maybe I don't. it won't be alive next time this year or whatever. Like right. The, the fucking yeah, right. Shanahan thing. But like, um, but yeah, I, I, you know, <laughs> it, that was in retrospect probably a bad move. Yeah, yeah, it didn't it didn't pan out. It didn't help that his first game in <laughs> in Seattle was like the biggest ass kicking of the John Schneider era. But like, you know, is what it is. That came at the hands of Mike McDonald. Now you have Mike McDonald, mm-hmm. and like, look, I mean, it really does feel like the dawning of a new era in Seattle. It will be fascinating to see what direction John Schneider and Mike McDonald take it, Danny. You are the man. Thank you for spending your afternoon with us, man. Of course. I love it. Thanks for inviting uh, me. <laughs> that means a lot. Hey, look, many of the people listening already know and love you, but for folks who might not be familiar, where can they find more of you and your stuff? And for the ones that hate me. Um, yeah, well, especially for the haters. So you can find my work at theringer.com. Uh, at my NFL draft guide is at nfldraft.theringer.com. You can find me on Twitter at Danny B. Kelly. Um. Yeah. Oh, and the Ringer Fantasy Football Show slash the Ringer NFL Draft Show is the podcast I host several times a week. So check that out. It's my favorite podcast besides this one. <laughs> All right, man. Appreciate. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, that was that was obvious, you know. All right, y'all. That's gonna do it for today. As always, you can find Mike and I on social media as well. I am on Twitter at, at Jackson Bevins. That's J A C S O N. Remember that no K is okay when spelling my name. Mike is on Twitter at, at Mike Barwin, and the show itself is at Cigar Thoughts. You can catch full video episodes on our YouTube channel at Cigar Thoughts and find the rest of our socials at CigarThoughtsNFL.com. This episode is brought to you by Glenn Fittick Premium Single Malt Scotch Whiskey. I've long been a huge fan of their lineup, and we are thrilled to have them on board as a sponsor of the show. If you're watching on YouTube, you've seen me enjoying a glass of their latest, delectable 14-year release. If you want a scotch that combines an initial kick with an incredibly smooth finish, then Glenfiddich is for you. And one of the great things about a great scotch is how well it plays with a good cigar. Speaking of, 
We do have our own special release of cigars that can be purchased at a terrific price as a listener of the show. Until now, you've been able to order your own bundle of 10 for just $169, which is less than half of what this blend sells for in cigars on the open market. But because of the success of the Cigar Thoughts release, we have lowered the price to $149, and we've decided to keep it there. That's right, just $149 for a bundle of 10. As many of you know, we partnered with one of the most prestigious cigar manufacturers in the world to release these official Cigar Thoughts cigars, which you can order directly from CigarThoughtsNFL.com. Just follow the link on the show page to get these easy-to-smoke stogies rolled with 13-year-aged premium Dominican tobacco leaf, or hit us up on Twitter or Instagram, and we'll send you the details directly. The cigars come with the Bevita humidification pack and a Mylar storage bag to make sure they stay fresh whether you have a humidor or not. And of course, you can listen to this show and read every article at fieldgoals.com. And if you're listening on Spotify or Apple Podcasts and you like the show, drop us a five-star rating and leave a quick review. Thank you to all of y'all listening for your continued support of the show. We know you've only got so much time for podcasts in your life, and it's an honor to be a part of that for y'all. Please know that by sharing this show on social media and with your friends, you give us the juice to keep making this happen. We'll be back soon, but in the meantime, onwards and upwards, my friends. <laughs>